moderator for this session. <laughs> it is my good friend Nancy who's doing that job. But I am interrupting your session just very briefly because I have a very special um, uh, achievement that I would like to recognize for one of our panelists here today. And uh, I'd like to bring this recognition on behalf of council, staff, and also all of you as Dr. Fries's engineering colleagues. Um, in Ontario, <coughs> or sorry, in Canada, Engineers Canada has bestowed the designation of Fellow of Engineer of Canada upon Dr. Fries. These Fellows of Engineers Canada allow the individual to put the initials FEC after their name. To be eligible for this recognition, a volunteer must have served in one or more of the following capacities, as president of one of Canada's engineering constituent members, or as a volunteer for engineering, um, as a volunteer in the engineering profession for at least 10 years. And for those of you who know the track record of Dr. Fries, you would know that she has volunteered for much more than 10 years, and that this fellowship is long in coming. And uh, I would like to ask Ingrid, if she's here from the Ottawa chapter, to join me on stage because that is Monique's home chapter. And I have with me um, a, uh, a recognition certificate of her fellowship with Engineers Canada. And it also comes with a pin that I do hope that she will wear proudly and that she will change all of her recognition cards and other notifications <laughs> to include the initials of FEC after her name for her well-earned fellowship. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Fries. <clears throat> It's very hard to pin it on top of the Order of Canada, my friends. It says good. Thank but, you. Uh, but yeah. Thank you. So glad you were able to support Thank me. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so surprised you're right about that. Yeah. And here's your certificate. Oh, thank you. And this is a letter from President Carrick Costanis congratulating you. Thank you. You are most welcome. And with that, that was my official duty for this time, and I'm quite sure you'd like to get to the panel. So, Nancy Hill. Thanks. Thanks, Diane. Um, I'm, I was privileged to be asked to uh, chair this, this uh, panel on women in engineering. Um, my background, for people who don't know, was the uh, uh, Women in Engineering Committee was one of the first committees that got me involved with PEO, and they haven't seen the last of me, lucky <laughs> PEO. Um, anyway, and and when I first joined the committee in 1993, I was actually very fortunate to meet both Val Davidson and Monique Fries, who are leaders in, in the work of women in engineering, and we're extremely fortunate to have them here today. Um, all of the panelists um, have amazing academic credentials. And, and they all have their PhDs, they all are leaders in their professions and, and um, are amazing women. But it's really what they have done in an ancillary capacity that we're talking about today. And, and they have shaped the community of women and engineers in, in Ontario and in Canada and, and the engine, engineering community generally. And we're extremely fortunate to have them here today to talk about the issue of women in engineering. Um, the way we're going to break this up is each of, the, each of our panelists are going to have about eight minutes to speak. Then we're going to have a brief discussion among the panelists. And then we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, so, and, and the way we're going to break it up is Val is going to speak first and she's going to speak generally about some of the initiatives in the education um, venue it, with regard to women in engineering. Um, Monique's going to give an overview and, and Wendy's going to give us some thoughts in looking to the future. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a biography of each of our, each of our um, uh, panelists. 
Val Davidson completed her Bachelor of Engineering in Chemical Engineering from McMaster University, did her, her MSc in Food Science at the University of Guelph, and then her PhD in Chemical Engineering at U of T. She joined the University of Guelph in 1988 and, and has established a strong interdisciplinary research program in food and biological engineering with an emphasis on the application of fuzzy mathematics and statistical methods to process control and decision support systems. In 2003, Val was named the NSERC Chair for Women in Science in Engineering for Ontario. Um, and then in 2008, her term was renewed um, with the uh, sponsorship of Research in Motion as well as NSERC, which does a really nice segue into Monique, who was the first chair of, of uh, the NSERC Women in Engineering. And when, we, when she first took it on, she was for all of Canada. And then she um, convinced NSERC that we really needed five chairs. Um, and then she was the first chair for Ontario. Um, as you can see, Monique has showed incredible leadership for women in engineering, but she also has a, 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 an amazing pedigree as an, as an electrical engineer. Um, so Monique graduated in electrical engineering um, and received the Anth Anth Athlone Fellowship and a master's in philosophy in electrical engineering um, and engineering medicine at Imperial College of Science and Technology in London in the UK, and a Master's of Business Administration at the University of Moncton, New Brunswick, and a doctor, and a doctorate from Amherst uh, University in Rotterdam. <laughs> Clearly I'm monolingual. <laughs> she also has five honorary degrees from various institutions and the Order of Canada. In addition, um, Monique has recently published a book called The Bold and the Brave, which uh, chronicles from the very early days women in science and engineering. And, and in regard to that, there's, there's, a, um, there's some free IEEE books that, that um, uh, include a, um, an, interview. an interview with Monique at the launch of the book, and they're over, they're over at the side. Uh, Wendy Zukier is, a, uh, is the Assistant Dean at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University, um, a Professor of Information Technology Management and the founder of the University's Diversity Institute. Uh, Wendy was a member of the Ryerson's Women in Engineering Committee and taught a module in equity issues to all first-year engineer students in the early 90s. She has a PhD in Management Science from, from York University an MBA and an MA from the University of Toronto. And honorary doctor, she too has honorary doctorates. In 2000, the University of Toronto named her one of the thousand alumni who shaped the century. Um, and if you don't know, Wendy also is involved with the Coalition of Gun Control. And although I haven't met Wendy before today, I felt like I knew her because one of the um, committee members on our Women in Engineering Committee was also active with Wendy in the Coalition of Gun Control. So um, I feel connected, although I've never met her. Anyway, in any event, we're going to start. And as I said, Val's going Val's to be our first, first speaker. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm speaking primarily on engineering education is that uh, one of the things that happened when I first became a faculty member I guess it was about 1990, um, there was a task force on women, a Canadian task force on women in engineering, which Monique chaired. And I had the privilege of being part of that um, task force. And there was a report written called More Than Just Numbers. And in writing that report, I actually um, was the sort of uh, editor of the section on engineering and ed or education um, for women and by women. And as Nancy has indicated, I am currently the NSERC RIM Chair for Women in Science and Engineering. Uh, over the past seven years that I've been in this position, I've honed my vision for the chair. And I'd like to just give you uh, some brief comments about the work that has been done as part of the chair program, as well as the work that I think we still need to do. My vision is a science, engineering, and technology culture in Ontario that welcomes the contributions of all, 
that supports the educational and career goals of all, and that benefits from the talents of a diverse group of people. Hence, the chair's mission is to attract, engage, inspire, support, encourage, and ultimately retain women as students and professionals in science, engineering, and information technology. Now, if we're going to accomplish this mission in the area of engineering, we have to strengthen our, the quality of our connections with our audiences. The information that we provide about the content of programs and careers in engineering is important but not sufficient. More women will be truly engaged if we can convey the context, the creativity, excitement, and teamwork involved in research and innovation, careers that provide opportunities to produce products and processes that improve lives, and finally, real life examples of, of women who are successful as professionals and leaders in these fields. In the CHAIRS program, we believe in starting early because we want to attract the attention of young women in late elementary and secondary school who are at the point of deciding about high school courses as well as post-secondary interests. And a great example of our success with this audience is Go Eng Go Eng Girl or Genie Les Filles. This year, on October 16th, we expect that up to 800 young women and their parents will experience the sixth annual event focusing on engineering a caring profession. This event will, is coordinated by the Ontario Network of Women in Engineering, or ONWI, which is a partnership of the 15 schools and faculties of engineering in Ontario. It was initiated and continues to be supported by the CHAIR program. Over its five-year history, Go Eng Girl has reached over 4,000 girls with the assistance of many allies. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the 1,200 undergraduate graduate students and alumna who have served as role models at these events. Now, those of you who have been trained as engineers may not realize that for a significant amount, a significant part of our population, engagement in and understanding of science and engineering culture is not the norm. Our classroom survey results that only confirm that only about one-third of the current population of students indicate that they have any interest in becoming a scientist, but there are no gender differences in these responses. Unfortunately, the proportion of young women in high school who indicate they have no interest in engineering is high, almost 50 percent. However, the percentage that are indicating not sure is almost as high, so I do have, um, I'm still optimistic about our potential to influence. The scope of our challenge is societal. Even those with a burgeoning interest in science and engineering will find it hard to sustain their engagement without su positive support from their peers, their parents, and the images and the opinions they gather from society. Change in so social attitudes is painfully slow. We can celebrate the success of the social networking campaign behind the voting of computer engineer Barbie. Now, I certainly cast my vote in favor of um, the computer engineer career and forwarded this link to, to, to others to vote on. Um, but since Mattel announced this decision a few months ago, the social networks are still buzzing because um, it's a controversial decision. Um, and I realize that not everybody's in favor of, of this model, but the reality is that young girls form dreams and ideas about their futures as they play together with their Barbie dolls. Now, the Mattel designers have created computer engineer Barbie wearing a binary code pattern T, equipped with all the latest gadgets, including a smartphone, Bluetooth headset, and a pink laptop. Now, certainly, I think computer, even if you don't like that model, computer engineer Barbie has the potential to dispel some unfair preconceptions about computer science and engineering and to inspire a new generation of girls to explore these fields. Another audience that we want to encourage are undergraduate and graduate students who are engaged in engineering programs at universities. When, what we have learned that when contemplating their careers in engineering, these students benefit from support in two key areas. Their perception of their own competencies across a complete set of professional skills and a full awareness of the range, and opportunities, the range of opportunities and pathways to success. For example, we have developed a workshop we call Academic Boot Camp to help PhD students and postdocs plan for an academic career, and this is an important part of the uh, work that we do to try and encourage to see more women in faculty positions. And Boot Camp participants have clearly pr appreciated the practical advice from faculty and administrators who lead the discussions and, um, and help the, uh, 
provided advice from the trenches. But this model could easily be extended to um, other career paths um, outside of academic areas. The network of regional chairs has conducted a national survey of graduate students in science and engineering. And the survey has helped us to assess graduate student experiences in terms of climate and support, as well as to identify relationships between these experiences and future intentions. For both women and men, it is clear that advisor support is a significant influence, strongly correlated to uh, self-efficacy and confidence in obtaining a career in, the field of, in their field of study. So what we need to do is make advisors aware of these findings and the benefits of providing positive supports for their students. Now, I realize that many of the, comp the elements of the work that I've just outlined were actually suggested in the report more than just numbers. And when I look back at those chapters on the education, I see many recommendations that are still valid today. We need to work with teachers and parents to make sure that they are aware of the changes in engineering programs and that they are not promoting negative stereotypes. Role models and mentors do make a difference. We need to continue work on creating positive educational climates as long as women remain a minority in engineering programs. So why are we moving forward at such a slow pace? As you can see, this is not work that can be done by any one individual. It takes a network and allies from many layers of the education system to keep it moving forward. And certainly the, the NSERC chairs uh, for Women in Science and Engineering is an important program. Unfortunately, it's, it's a term that um, is five years and then there's a change and, and quite often a gap. So, as I said, I'm optimistic about the progress we're making. I'm particularly interested in hearing from, when we do open up for general um, discussion, um, I'm interested in hearing from the students who are in today's audience. And I'll now turn it over to Monique to talk about her perspective. Thank you very much. Well, I'm overwhelmed. I didn't expect this surprise, so I want to thank all my colleagues who did this. And um, I'm going to be very proud to change my cards <laughs> when I get home on Monday. <laughs> so in the meantime, I just want to say, after uh, Valerie, and she was a very excellent member of the Committee on uh, Women in Engineering, <clears throat> do you remember in the early 1990s the Barbie that said, math is tough? So I think it's about time that we get a computer engineer Barbie. So just maybe to counter. Too bad I didn't buy one because it'd be worth a lot of money today. <laughs> the other one, <laughs> yes, as an example of things not to do. So I'd like to talk to you today about this this aspect of the report um, that w talks about the associations because, you know, it's and and Dr. Patrice said this morning some very important things that are also in my book on what can engineering schools do about curriculum and teaching style? That is so important. And we're not going to change diversity in engineering until we also address all those issues. But today I'm going to talk to you engineers and non-engineers and students about what can the profession do because, you know, we've been talking about that 20 years ago, right? The report came out in April 2000, uh, sorry, 1992. <laughs> and. Um, so here is a, a little bit of a summary of what our report said. If I can read this. So we had four sections, as you heard about the first two sections from Valerie, and uh, we had 29 recommendations in all. And all, as Wendy said in an article in the Policy Engagement uh, Journal of April issue, uh, she cited this report and again mentioned many times that this is valid, we should still you know, work on doing these things. And you know, we're talking about 20 years now, two decades. So technical societies, IEEE as well, they should learn also from this message. Um, so at the time we said we should create a committee in each of these organizations that looks at gender issues. Okay, so might, there might be lots of gender issues, there might not be lots of gender issues depending on the society, but at the same time, it's important to address are there issues, what are they, and what can we work on 
in the next couple of years. And I always recommend don't work on more than two, three things in a one-year program because you won't get to do anything if it's too big a list. So, um, so if you have this committee, then you have a discussion, you have a conversation about these issues. So that's very important. Now, when I did this, I know that uh, some associations, which I won't name, said, well, we don't need a committee. And others in Ontario, as you know, Nancy, the first one was created here at PEO. So, um, and, and Quebec still has one, and, and uh, this one has been moved to OSPI, a member of the council meeting. <laughs> yes. And of course, when, when they moved it to OSPI, uh, two minutes later, I created the diversity committee at PEO because I thought, you know, and then I put a motion <laughs> across, and uh, I couldn't let that go completely. We had to have discussion about these things. So we also want to encourage and help fund uh, networking cent you know, events for women. And I know that they've supported, for example, the Claudette Mekelasson, and I held the first one in Ottawa, the, the um, conference in the autumn, and there's also one in the spring, I believe. Yeah. And so PO has always been funding this, uh, partially, I think, and uh, it, this is really has been done. So some of the things that we mentioned 20 years ago have been done, but not all of them have been sustained, and many of them have not been done. So we're going to put them back on the board again. So. Um, so then nominate women for election. Well, now you've seen a woman president and uh, now you see an incoming one tomorrow. So this is kind of wonderful. And apparently there are four provinces and territories who will have women at the meeting tomorrow who are also presidents in their own regions. So, so that's progress. Um, also, of course, um, we also had the goal to have as many women uh, as the proportion of members. Now, just remember, though, that only 25% of women engineers become members of their professional association, and about 50% of men. So we really do have a lot of engineering students who graduate who do not join the profession. So again, uh, so when you're looking at the numbers, you're looking at really a very low percentage of women who join. Well, there must be reasons for that, right? So maybe if we do some of the things from the committee report, maybe we're going to get there with having more of them feel that they belong and that they want to belong. So gender inclusive documents, well, a lot of this has been done. We kept repeating many times, you know, he, 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 okay, look, we're here too, you know, so he, she, and they, if you want to do the plural, it's okay. Um, so th that has been, I think, uh, moved quite a bit. And then the Code of Ethics has been done, but Nancy would be here to tell you that she and Peter Hiscock, it took about eight years or ten yeah. to get that done, So, but it happened. So the, the positive news is it happened. The they were the first. At PEO, it was the first to say that harassment and discrimination were a breach of the Code of Ethics. It was a misconduct. And in fact, the first case, I think, was this engineer in Ottawa, right, Karmash? Yeah. Uh, who actually um, did gender harassment insults uh, um, to Anne Rene, who, uh, who had to finally leave the construction world, which she loved very much uh, because of this. But then he was, he's still on the PO website that he had to pay $10,000 fine and he had to uh, do an ethics course, which I was so happy about. <laughs> I mean, so that he would learn about these things. Um, so the next one was uh, hold gender sensitivity programs. And again, PEO was the first one to develop with the uh, women's directorate, with yes. Anne Holmes. Yes. We developed the first kit together with Elsa Saragelli and Nancy, mm -hmm. myself, and others. And so this kit was to, um, to do gender sensitivity in our engineering schools. I only remember, though, that it was done like once in each place, and that's it. So again, time to resuscitate these slides and these programs and, you know, two minutes, two minutes? okay, <laughs> well, I better hurry then. Um, and then, of course, uh, let me go faster then. So this is the book that, uh, The Bold and the Brave, and to me, this was a, a talk I gave for the Linda Shaw Memorial for the woman who was murdered, the engineering student from Western, and uh, then I decided to call my book by the same title of my speech and it's really because I feel women who are engineers are bold and they're brave and my dream is one day we won't have to be bold and brave to be engineers so 
um, just to tell you a bit that it's cyclical nature. You saw that we, Dr. Patrick showed you 23% back down, and actually in many schools now it's only 12% women, so we're back to 1988 levels. And so this is all because of views of women's abilities over 2,000 years. Uh, and in my book, I explain through these people's own writings, and it's not a question of period, because in every single era, they were men and women for education of women and men and women against. And so it's been really a cyclical uh, pattern. So in contemporary times, we still see this affecting the self-esteem of girls. And in, in just let me go quickly to, uh, and, and what is the biggest problem today? It's the persisting stereotypes. That's why women are not in engineering. It's the stereotypes. Women become uh, now doctors because they see a lot of role models there, and it's also helping humans. They see the connection. So um, the masculine culture of science and engineering, and this is a big chapter in my book. I, you'll see it's still there. I still feel it, even though I've been 40 years an engineer. It's still there, and I'm just coping with it in the sense that I do my thing, but it bothers me. It bothers a lot of women, and I think eventually I really want to have women's contributions and attributes be mingled and integrated with the masculine culture so that we can have uh, more diversity of opinions. And uh, the last chapter of my book is by my husband's. It's about Albert Einstein's wife and a couple of other women. He's a real good storyteller, and they're true stories. But just before his, because he keeps saying that his is the best chapter of the book, and I agree. <laughs> He's the writer, I'm the engineer. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but uh, the chapter just before is what are the values of feminine attributes that we could have in our profession? And my next book will do a lot more in that sense. My second book is already um, started in, in uh, research and um, the writing will come over the summer and it won't take eight years for the second one. <laughs> it will take uh, less time. <laughs> so thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Really pleased to be here. I, uh, I'm not an engineer, so it was very nice that I was uh, allowed in. And uh, I, I started working in this area, well, I worked with engineers um, in my very first job. And until that point, I had graduated with my first master's degree, I thought an engineer was the person in the back of the train if any of you are old enough to remember the caboose. And that tells you something about the education of girls more than 20 years ago, but I won't tell you how long ago. The second thing was um, Peter Hiscox was a colleague of mine at Ryerson in starting the Women in Engineering Committee after the murders at uh, Polytechnique. And he invited me in, even though it was not my area of specialty. And they needed someone to teach equity issues to all the first year engineers. And the harassment and equity coordinator at Ryerson said, oh, I'm not going in there. And Peter said, <laughs> Peter said, Wendy does gun control. She'll do anything. Send her. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's when you talk about cycles, it's really interesting because some of you may have noticed in the paper today the students of Polytechnic back on Parliament Hill fighting for the gun control legislation 20 years after the Montreal Massacre. And here we are 20 years after the Montreal Massacre having the same discussion. The more than just numbers report was brilliant. I, I do believe most of the recommendations apply today as they did almost 20 years ago. But where we have to really focus our attention is on implementation, is on accountability, and is on tracking where we are. And so my expertise is not in engineering, although I've worked with lots of engineers. It's really on change processes, and that's what I want to focus my attention on. Um, first thing I want to say, I do a lot of work with employers, IBM, Microsoft, and so on. There's no doubt that today the focus is on the business case for diversity. The focus is not so much on equity and equality and human rights, even though that certainly underpins it. There's recognition of the global war for talent, acute shortages in many sectors, the fact that there's um, increased recognition that diverse teams create more innovative solutions, and of course markets 
markets, whether we're talking the GTA or whether we're talking the world, markets are increasingly diverse. And if you don't have a diverse workforce, you can't serve the needs of diverse markets. Somewhere about 20 years ago, they realized, for example, women bought cars too. Do you remember when they, they had that insight? And so they stopped using us to decorate the advertisements and started pitching to us. Um, I'm not going to go through the numbers because I think you've already heard all about that. I really want to focus on, uh, in my few moments, this notion of an ecological model of change. And what I would say to you, we did, a, we did an evaluation of 70 women in, in technology projects over the last 15 years. Lots of activity, lots and lots and lots of activity. Little evaluation and limited sustained change. And I would argue that the reason for that is it's very difficult to sustain change, whether you're talking about the participation of women in engineering or whether you're talking about quitting smoking, whether you're talking about any kind of social or, or health issues, unless you address individual barriers, organizational institutional barriers, as well as the societal issues. And the societal issues are things like the Barbies, the organizational issues are the chilly climate for women, and the individual issues are the aspirations of young girls. So I want to talk about each of these in turn. Uh, lots of research on the factors affecting choice. It's interesting to note that surveys of high school students show girls are far less likely to even know what an engineer is. They may not want to be an engineer, they don't even know what an engineer is in many cases. So, that, And we also know that girls are far more susceptible to their parents' influence than peers. We also know that because of socialization and other factors, boys are more likely to have an intrinsic interest in technology, play with cars, things like that. And I would argue that that's part of the reason that when the dot-com bust occurred, girls left the profession at a higher rate than boys, right? Because a lot of girls were there because their parents were saying, good career, make lots of money, buy lots of shoes, right? <laughs> but the boys were there because they liked playing with stuff. So I think we've already heard a bit about um, some of the barriers in the social environment. And I, I won't talk about these in great detail, except to think about the contrast between engineering and forensic sciences, for example. Shows like CSI, um, you know, all of the, the plethora of bones, et cetera, et cetera, have fueled a tremendous interest in applied sciences around forensics. And interestingly enough, you see a high participation rate of girls. Think about the people who they see on television. Role models are important, um, and certainly the images in the media, which is something that I'm particularly preoccupied with. So if you're looking at strategies to address the social environment, it's really, really important to think about early education. And I. Uh, I am the mother. How many people, how many people here have uh, daughters? And how many people here ha feel that their images of themselves are very much shaped by what they see in the media? And how many of your daughters have thought potentially about being engineers? A fair number. What you find very often is young women who decide to be engineers, decide to be engineers because there's someone in their sphere who is an engineer. It's, it can be as simple as that. Um, I'll talk more later about issues around early education. We've heard about um, pedagogy and universities. All I would say to you, I hope, is there anyone from Ryerson here who will tell on me? <laughs> <laughs> All I would say to you, and I say this, um, I know what I'll say. I'll say business schools are subject to accreditation by something called AACSB in the United States. AACSB asks us to report on our diversity statistics. And guess what that does? I'll leave it to you to draw your own conclusions about the subtext. 
If we look at organizations, I've worked with lots of them, lots of initiatives to address recruitment and promotion, lots of initiatives to look at work-life balance, etc. And hey, guess what? The issues around work-life balance and parental responsibilities were driven to a certain extent in large organizations like Microsoft and Pratt Whitney and so on by concerns to attract and retain women. The current younger generation, the Gen Ys, or there are too many in the room for me to tell you what I really call them when they're not looking, um, are, are very concerned about exactly the same things, whether they're men or women. So a lot of the initiatives were put in place to address the family responsibilities of women around flex time, on-site childcare, et cetera, et cetera, to make organizations more female friendly, also make them more attractive places for young people of both genders. And see, some of them are nodding their heads. Not going to talk about any of this. Um, going to talk about individuals because I think this is one of the things that we really, really have to focus on. Um, they do mandatory standardized testing of uh, kids in grade three in, in Ontario. And kids in grade three, seven-year-olds, um, little girls outperform little boys in both math and science, right? You all know this. But when asked, are you good at math, are you good at science, little boys are more likely to say yes. And I would argue that that confidence gap is one of the biggest impediments that women face through their careers, whether they become engineers or they don't become engineers. And so I think there's an awful lot of work that can be done to coach and encourage young girls to choose careers because they know they can do it. And that will help encourage girls to choose engineering, but it will also help young women to set their sights higher. Um, the other thing that I think is, is very important is for all of us, whether we're men or women, to recognize that we have a role to, pe to play. And if you understand what the barriers are, you know, and I have colleagues who are, who are, um, are focused on systemic barriers. I accept those barriers exist. There's no question and we have to all work to fight them. At the same time, we have visible examples of success which should tell you that if we equip individuals to go around, to go under, or to knock down those barriers, they will be successful. And so I think it's important to recognize the barriers, to name them, to work on addressing them, but also to, to equip young women to overcome them because they certainly can. And, and for all of you in the room, it's important to recognize that you have a sphere of influence. You can take responsibility. You can influence the relationships with your vendors, your colleagues, your daughters, your friends. Everyone in this room who's an engineer, can out, male or female, can help reach out and ensure those high school girls are not like me and don't think engineers are the guys in the back of the train. Times are changing. Lots of encouraging signs. Lots of companies recognize that the images that they put forward are critically important. And there are lots of organizations that are making progress. And Ursula Franklin, who I love, um, I think said it best when she said that change comes not through revolution, but through millions of earthworms preparing the soil. Thank you very much. So the next part of the agenda was if you guys wanted to say things <laughs> amongst yourself or ask each other any specific questions. Or comments. Or comments. That would be good too. Well, I just wanted to add that. Um, are, the, are the mics on on the... Ah. Oh, yes. Yep. Uh, there we go. Does that work? Okay. 
I just wanted to add that uh, I didn't write the book to get rich because it's not going to happen. I wrote it because I wanted everyone to find something in the, that an action, every man and woman, that would make progress. Because it explains where the issues come from, and they come from 2,000 years ago and have been perpetuated over eras and eras and centuries. So I would like everybody to choose, when you read the book, if you do read the book, to choose an action so that we can move forward and stop the cycle of regression and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Val? Just one comment on um, this uh, issue of, uh, again, it comes back to something that was said this morning about the invisible profession and in general, our current surveys um, show that in asking high school students about, um, you know, what is an engineer, what is a scientist, and what is a technologist, very, they're very clear on what a scientist is. It's, you know, they take science classes and they see scientists on TV, um, but they, um, there's actually no gender difference. They're, they're just, they just, most genders don't know very much about what engineering is, and um, the difference in, the sc in, <laughs> in scoring their definitions would be that the females are likely to say they're just not sure, but the the males will um, generally come up with an answer that's incorrect. So <laughs> it, it comes back to that confidence again in, in just um, being make, making mistakes. But it, we do have a, an issue of the awareness of the gen of the public about um, the work that engineers do. Yes, thank you, Wendy. Did you have uh, some comments? Too? Yeah, I was. I was. I was going to say that. Um, I think it is important to recognize that there are certain very, very, very uh, entrenched um, beliefs, values, and so on that, that shape this discussion. I think it's equally important, though, to point to the fact that there are huge cultural differences. And in many cultures, um, the representation of women in the sciences and engineering and mathematics is much higher than in North American society. And I would actually argue that that points to uh, the fact that our, our media and our broad societal values play a very important but often um, unconsidered role. And that's part of the reason why, you know, sort of the, the bleeding edge in diversity practices in the private sector now, and you'll see this with uh, most of the very large Fortune 500 organizations in the United States, they actually have specific diversity policies. This, this applies to gender as well as to racialized minorities um, or other under, underrepresented groups. Very specific diversity policies, not just within the organization, but in their procurement policies. Mm -hmm. And some of you who do, do work with in the United States are probably aware of this. That, that has an impact on change much faster than all the rainbow posters in the world. And so what I would argue to the large organizations who say they're concerned about these things, and frankly to the accreditation bodies that say they're concerned about these things, Put your money where your mouth is, because those kinds of initiatives will influence the behavior of the educational institutions, of the SMEs, way more quickly than all of the education um, efforts in the world. And I think there's, there's good evidence, and, and we really need fact-based approaches to, to bringing about change. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so this is where we're going to open the... Uh, uh, discussion up to the floor if people have any questions or comments that they'd like to share with us. There's mics around. Yeah, I guess I'm not sure if this is a, a question or, or just an observation. Um, I, I'm an engineer. My name is Michael Day, and uh, I have a daughter who's eight years old. I have no sons, and I am, I have no idea other than. I guess, expressing my interest in science and math as to how I could and can, can encourage my daughter to keep those doors open is by doing math and science so at least she has the option you know, in the future if she wants to go that way. And I just, I don't know of any role models in my life that got me into engineering. 
I just like math and I like technology and I went there and none of my family members are in engineering or science. And I just liked it. So I don't have a role model as to how you just make your child like it. You know? <laughs> I know that's kind of just... I think they all might like to comment on this. <laughs> There are summer camps for the age of your daughter, so uh, all over the country. And uh, ACTUA is the, the central um, body that, um, that oversees these summer camps. I don't know where you live, but there are summer camps everywhere. The Go Inge Girl is for a little older. They're for grades 7, 8, 9, 10. But then uh, in Ottawa, we do Design Tomorrow's World as well, a little later than the Go Inge Girl, and that's for teachers and, and girls. And the first one going to go was with parents and girls. And the second one is, uh, is really to build the confidence in the girls in doing something non-traditional like a design. And so with the teachers, we do uh, grades uh, 10, 11, 12, and uh, 10, I think, and nine. And, and we found an incredible difference in their attitude afterwards. And they'd say, I didn't know I could do this. So you build not only the interest, but you build the confidence. So there are lots of programs in Canada. Just go on websites and look for summer camps and science engineering and all that. Al? Well, I think um, our experience is that um, there's certainly uh, a range of interests, but um, certainly lots of the young girls really get excited about um, computer technologies. We, we were just... Uh, we did a workshop last week where we were basically doing simple robotics with computers, but it was in a very creative context. <laughs> we basically had them create robots of plants and animals in the, in the rainforest. And, so, and we had ways of connecting them to sensors and, and things that move, Lego components that would move. So they, they all got into that. So I think you have to find ways where your daughter will be engaged in um, these, these technical areas and see the value of, or f find interest in math in ways that excite her and get her imagination. Um, that's gonna change as she, as she goes older and <laughs> there will be doubtless sometimes when you're very frustrated with <laughs> trying to guess what, <laughs> what it is that's gonna <laughs> grab her. But um, you know, I think there are, as Monique mentioned, these camps, there are also organizations like the Girl Guides. They, they run really good programs um, because there are things like badges and, and it's, um, you know, they just run a very good leadership um, model. So those would be the kinds of things that I would suggest. And I would, uh, I would just add to this. Um, some of you know Peter Hiscox and he and his um, then 12-year-old daughter um, rewired part of my house and <laughs> she's now a master's degree in engineering and I would say she was an only child of um, someone who was you know an engineer technology I was going to use a bad word so I won't um, but I think he played with her he played with her doing the stuff that he liked to do and that got her really interested in building stuff wiring stuff figuring out how things worked. So as a father, my guess is that's one of the things that you can do to demystify and expose a, a daughter to the fun. I don't find that stuff fun, but the fun stuff that you, some of you like to do. Okay, do you, what, okay? You're, <laughs> you go <call> that. <laughs> um, I was a little bit, my name is Pravin Shah. Uh, I'm a retired engineer now. But I was interested what Wendy said about uh, cultural impact. Um, what I find that the society here is very hardworking, but they have no control on their children because they may have control up till 12 years old. When they become 14, 15, 16, whether they are boys or girls, they become very independent and parents back away. First cultural shock I got when I came in 74, we bought a house in Niagara Falls and within a week we heard some neighbor, six houses from there, has thrown the kid out of the house, 16 year old kid. And we never do that in our life, but that's the shock I got. Here, kids have a lot of uh, freedom. 15, 16, they, the parents have no control. So up till 12 years, 30 years, you have control. So that's a systemic uh, problem. The other thing is that 
when we grew up, my children were born here, so when they grew up in deep river and they did the science and maths, they did differential equation, int integration, everything in high school. When we did it, we did it in the university. And I was impressed, even my daughter was doing so much differential equation and I was very much impressed with that. Finally, she didn't become an engineer, but she became a pharmacist, but that's okay. She did something. <laughs> <laughs> and my son became a software engineer, but the question arises is that the society has to have some kind of a stability. In our school, in whatever I noted, even the boys, they don't continue for higher education. My son's uh, friends, school friends, most of them, I, we always see that, never finish even undergraduate, because the society is so comfortable here and they have a freedom. And the other background, social background, is that plumbers, if you are a technician, plumber, carpenters, electrician, you earn more money than even uh, an engineer can earn. This morning that was talked about that our salaries are very low. So people don't have a prospect. And engineering for us is most, mostly outdoor life. You know, if you are an electrical engineer, you go in the field and, you know, black flies and mosquitoes and everything, civil engineers, same thing. So that also puts away a lot of difficulties in women. So there's a little bit of a cultural thing there. Thank you. Next. Um, hi. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> um, my name is Heather, and I'm a Carlton, uh, a Carlton student. Um, I'm here, um, one of the 20 students, like female students, that uh, WISE and OSEP uh, sponsored to actually come and attend this conference. Um, I would like to thank you for that, first of all. And I have a sort of a question or a comment that for here to everyone to reflect upon. Um, when I was looking around this morning, I found that the 20 students, the 20 females, were, were the, the ones that um, you had sponsored to bring here, uh, the younger generation. I'm sorry, <laughs> that doesn't seem very right. But anyways, uh, my point is, if there wasn't the initiative or the policies, the diversity policies, to actually engage females, do you think that uh, women would actually enter the, the engineering field? Um, I find, like I, I was, um, I was work, I was talking to one of the people on IBM, and and uh, they have the Extreme Blue program um, in the summer, and they don't have any females, and they had, they were trying to target females to actually um, apply and actually, but go into the program because they have a very, like they had um, the 100, per, like the 20, uh, 20 people that t were taken last year, they were all fe male. So do you think that without like these policies, do you think of policies or initiatives to actually engage the females that we would, um, female, you'd, you'd actually have a higher number of females in the field? That's my question, thank you. Okay, I briefly though, you guys, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, no doubt that we have to involve females in all levels, and that's what I mean by integrating feminine perspectives. Otherwise, we're not going to see a big change. So involving them in everything. You know, I'm going to a conference many times, and I see all the keynotes, and guess what? Not a single woman or maybe one token woman, and still happens And my next conference that I'm going to in Greece now in a few weeks. and. So there is a, a huge issue, and I think that every level has to say, let's find uh, the, the women who could participate. I'll just tell you a very quick story. Uh, John Gerard, when I worked for him in NAMST, I was a na National Advisory Committee to the Prime Minister. John called me, he was, met me at the airport one day, it, we, he, we just happened to be in the lounge together, and he said, you know this Canada, cross Canada science, um, uh, they were asking the public and, and all the scientists to come and comment on their science policy. And he said, Monique, you know, I received a whole bunch of names and they were all men. So then I wrote back to everybody and I said, now you sent me the names of the men, I want you to send me the names of the women. So it shows you again, the women are always invisible. So maybe engineers are invisible, women are doubly invisible. And we disappear from everywhere. And so I think we have to think about ways to profile women and successful women, ordinary women, because ordinary men make it. So all these things I would like to leave with everyone in the room. Val? I'll be really brief. I would say that as long as women are 
such a minority, and by a minority I mean well under, um, well, 30% would be sort of a, a more better, a better balance, then I will um, advocate for initiatives like the, the WISE OSEP Award to simply bring women together as you had a chance to work or to, to meet each other last night because I think that networking um, is so important in offsetting the isolation that exists when women are in such low numbers. And that's why I would continue to advocate for it. Okay. Sorry, did you did you want to add something, Wendy? Or I, I was just going to say it's it's funny Val would say thirty percent because that's generally regarded as the tipping point. Once you hit thirty percent, the environment changes, and then generally you don't have to do as much work. Okay. Oh, you guys are so fair. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amy Boutenhouse. I'm from Queen's University. Um, I'm I was also with Heba last night having dinner. I just want to first quickly thank um, Val for asking for um, the thoughts of uh, younger students here. And I, I just want to say that um, I, I respect your interest in the, the uh, computer engineering Barbie. Um, I think that's a, a, funny, um, a funny thing, but, but for me, my, my understanding and my um, interest in femini feminism is different than that. And I, I would not fall in the camp of supporting um, computer engineer Barbie. I think Barbie is part of the reason why there are not enough women in, in engineering and um, still why women are underrepresented in many aspects of society. So maybe that's from the younger generation, maybe that's just me, I'm not sure. Um, but my, uh, my question is, is um, asking um, for comments um, from uh, Monique because on your slide you mentioned um, gender, I'm, I can't remember what the word was, but uh, you mentioned ceremonies and um, I'm not sure how many people have gone through the Iron Ring ceremony, um, but in my experience from that, um, it was very clear to me that the ceremony was written for uh, men, Christian men who were um, civil engineers, very, very um, not inclusive of the body of people, um, the very, very diverse body of people who try to graduate, and that ceremony is supposed to be welcoming you into the working world and is in fact jarring and quite frightening, but also a good indication of the culture that actually exists in the working world. So I was wondering if you have comments on that. Yes, thank you. I would have mentioned that if I had more than 10 minutes, but in my 12 years as the chair, I definitely uh, looked around the country to see if there were better ways. And I know that in Quebec, it's quite different at Polytechnique and in Laval, they have open meetings because the bar, the, the doors are barred in, in other provinces and it's just engineers can go in. And, and there it's more open, parents can come, and it's far more, um, I would say, diverse in its approach. I was, I got my iron ring, I was the first one in Ottawa from your Ottawa University grad, and it was a thousand men and me maybe, I don't know how many, but he came, you know, brother, brother, and then didn't know what to say to me, you know, so I said, well, sister, you know. <laughs> then we had to go drink some beer and stuff, you know, yeah, so. I would like to see the change, and it's a very, very closed uh, network, but I did talk to some of them, and I think we have to get maybe the young voices, and I'm ready to work on that again because I didn't have time, but it is very important. I agree with you. You want to belong, you know? You're not a son of Marta, right? So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, that cold iron, I guess. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lou Richard. I've uh, been an engineer for many years. Uh, I've got a 13 year old granddaughter who's expressed an interest in being in engineering. And one of the things I'd like to comment on is this comment about uh, girls in grade three do better in math and science. Uh, don't dispute that uh, comment, but I've also read studies that males are better wired for math and science than females. And I told my granddaughter that she had to be good in math to be an engineer. And s she surprised me and said, oh, that's not my best subject. I only get 80%, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which made me think that uh, maybe girls are good in math and they may be better than males, but it may not be their best subject which is why they tend to go to other occupations where their uh, better subjects lead them to. And the other 
thing uh, we talked about is uh, the interest, getting a general interest in young uh, kids and becoming engineers. And one way to do that is to get them a hero. You know, young kids want to be policemen, firemen, uh, doctors. Because the TV shows are there and they show... Julie Payette. <laughs> the problem with an engineering TV show, considering the time it takes for engineers to do things, no matter what discipline you are, in one season, the person would age 40 years. So it's a, it's a challenge to overcome. So. I just want to answer that in my book, there's 2009 data over a million kids in the U.S. and there were no more differences anymore on science and engineering performance. And the girls in Japan do better than the boys in America, yeah. so that's another issue. And, and just if I can add to that, 40% sure. of students in Ontario majoring in mathematics are women. So I actually don't think mm. math ability is a barrier. I think it's self-efficacy and confidence. Mm -hmm. Well, my suggestion is that the, uh, the girls are better in other subjects as well, which attracts them towards other mm -hmm. careers. Oh, that's true, in, in reading and health sciences. Yeah. I just oh. wanted to... Um, so sorry, um, well, so you first and then Ingrid, it's Ingrid, right? And then, and then you, okay? Okay, sorry. Um, I, I just want to go back to the question about uh, mentors and strong role models, and I want to tie that into the fact that women are leaving the profession a lot at a higher rate than, than men leave, and there's a level of disillusionment. And from my personal experience, I can tell you that uh, I've observed an increasing chill towards towards mm -hmm. women in the profession. And I certainly know of, of, of female engineers who will happily openly state they would not encourage young girls to go into engineering. And, and if you know, on a good day, they'll send them off to the local wise chapter, and on a bad day, they'll still go into law and medicine. So the question is, what's being done about the women who are currently in the profession? And I'm going to point out that if you look at all the men in this room, almost all of them raise their hands when you ask, do you have a, a, a daughter? And the rest of the people here are women. And it's like, okay, so where are all the other men? You've what? <laughs> Yay! One out of... But Howard's highly evolved. <laughs> the exception that proves the rule. So the question is, what's being done to support, to A, support the women who are currently in the profession, and B, get the people who don't have a vested self-interest involved in this? Sure. Pardon? Um, okay, I can mention that. So uh, the Women in Engineering Advisory Committee at OSPE is looking at workplace issues. Um, and I think really to, to uh, we're rolling out a survey really in the next couple months to compare men and women's experience in the workplace, but also to help develop maybe some initiatives with regard to retention. Um, but we're going to wait for the, some of the results in the survey to talk about that. But now that I've got the mic, I'm going to comment a little bit. Um, my background, which I didn't really share with you guys, is that I'm both an engineer and a lawyer. And um, I find it interesting with uh, some of the discussion about the chill and the differences. And um, uh, there was a very interesting study by um, uh, Bertha Wilson looking at law. And, and, and female lawyers in, in the profession. And, there, and we, um, in law, had many of the same issues, as did women engineers. And I personally think that some of the issues that, that, that women engineers face is really about educated women in professions in our society. And, and, and back to some of the things that, that Monique and, and really all our speakers were, were speaking to, which is the role of women in our society, talking about um, um, having the confidence to, to be everything that you can be. And, and I think that you know, there are opportunities really for us uh, in the women in engineering com community to work with, with other professional women to, to address some of these issues. Wendy? Yeah, I think we did a survey of uh, 
17,000 middle managers and about 8,000 of them worked in big ICT firms. So they weren't just engineers. But what a couple of things you'll find is in general, large firms, not exclusively, but in general, have um, much better developed human resources policies around recruitment, retention, um, open and fair promotional policies, uh, support in the workplace, uh, pipeline development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Huge gap with SMEs. Um, and so the experiences that came out around perceptions of workplace fairness and how they were treated and so on, what we saw is in general, if you worked at a fairly large company, it was more likely your experience was not bad. But if you worked in a, in a small SME in the high tech sector, there was a much higher likelihood that your experience was not so great. And I would actually argue that again, the, the societal piece is important, but there are very specific policies and practices, best practices, well documented, that can go a long way to addressing uh, the chilly climate and to creating fair and inclusive workplaces. And I think companies have to be held accountable. Okay, I'm, we're, we're actually over time, so I'm going to cut it off. I, you three people have been standing there. Three more questions, that's it, and then <laughs> we'll wind up. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Leslie Hersey from the University of Toronto. I'm a PhD student in civil engineering. Uh, I know that a lot of initiatives have been done out of, out of the classroom, so Go Eng Girl, Engineering Outreach, Summer Camps, and I'm just wondering what the initiatives have been to go into the classrooms because a lot of the people who end up teaching children, and I'm not saying this is if someone has to teach children, are you know women who have you know careers where they can go and look after their children in the summer. So how are you going into classrooms and sort of uh, promoting equity amongst young women in the classroom? Pral, you want to speak to that? Well, just a quick answer is that that in fact is an issue or an initiative that. Um, Research in Motion is quite interested in, and, and we are actually, um, as a group, I'm part of the group, but also um, Perimeter, Perimeter Institute Outreach people are involved. We're going into middle schools to talk, to, to actually do workshops for the teachers, because we recognize this issue of not so comfortable with science. And that's exactly where we want to see more sustained change, is to basically, um, you know, we, we do do a lot of workshops in the classroom, but you know, that we're only there once. Yeah. It's gonna be much better um, if the, there's a more sustained effort. And there are programs like Engineers in the Classroom or an Engineer in Residence that exactly that, go, people, engineers going into the classroom. Good for you. Just, yes. Hi, I'm Kim Farwell, um, president of APEGA. I've got a comment and then I've got a question. And the comment is based on um, a discussion already on the Iron Ring Ceremony. And I just want to clarify, first of all, that uh, Alberta also has an open ceremony. The other thing, though, um, the ceremony, um, I've done a lot of historical research into the ceremony. I've been into the archives of um, the EIC, the, uh, the Engineering Institute of Canada, uh, to understand more about the ceremony and its history. And it's actually a very beautiful history that's very time-oriented with respect to the language and respect to the history. The Sons of Martha is actually a passage from the Bible and the incredible poem that Rudyard Kipling wrote, the reasons he is involved in our ceremony and uh, the history behind that and how impressed he was with the Canadian engineers during the war that he actually housed in his own home. Um, that aspect of it is something that is so precious to our profession and it's something only Canadian engineers have. So before we get too excited about the language and how it is inclusive or not inclusive of women, we need to understand the context of that ceremony, the time it was written, and how that is really a gift to a Canadian profession that no one else in the world has. Now, with respect to be being inclusive to women, we maybe need to change some of the context around it, but if we choose to change that history, we're gonna lose something that is more precious than any other profession has. Um, so my, that's my comment. My, uh, my question, though, um, being in the industry, it is cold to women. And we're trying to recu recruit women into engineering, but I think we're still paying the price, and I'm gonna call it the affirmative action price, where we're still looked at 
um, she got there because she's a girl. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered what the panel would say about that. Well, you know, I was asked that many times when I went around the country with the Committee of Women in Engineering. And what I said is, would you rather not get the job because you're a woman? Uh, at the same time, I explained, you know, a little further that it's very important that we talk with young men as well. And uh, we were saying that with Jean Lynch, remember, with the committee, that it's important to dialogue about what is affirmative action and what is equity. And that it's not taking the jobs away from men, but it's finding... Uh, removing the barriers to women. So, you know, when you explain it uh, properly, I think that the dialogue becomes less angry. Uh, about the Iron Ring ceremony, I think it's important that the history and the bridge in Quebec, I had their first uh, ring from that, and uh, I think the history can be explained in the ceremony itself. And I think we need to keep that uh, history, I agree with you, but also I think we need to move to a less uh, Christian. Uh, a lot of the young students at Queens told me one day, well, we're, we feel disenfranchised. We, we don't want to go to the ceremony because you know, we're not from that religion and we feel totally uh, left out. So I think we need to move to something more modern, but remember the past. I, I agree with you. OK. Um, hi, my name is Joelle, and I'm also one of the students sponsored to go here, and I'm thankful for this experience. And I guess what I want to say is a comment and a suggestion on the subject of breaking the stereotypes in the school studying engineering and in the profession. Because what I see right now is there are many women ambassadors talking to women students, encouraging them. But I was wondering and hoping if it's possible that there could be some male ambassadors talking to male students to help the environment be more friendly for women. And I'm saying that because I know that men, I talk to my friends a lot, and I know that they believe that we can do what we can, what, what they can do. Even my friends tell me that, that but uh, uh, because other men still have that stereotype for women, they're not that confident to, they don't have that confidence to spread that word to other men. So. Um, I'm gonna speak to that. <laughs> So I was very lucky when I was on WIAC because we had two, uh, well, we had actually a few men, um, two in particular who, who made an incredible contribution um, to our committee. One was Peter Hiscox, whose name has come, come up a number of times, and the other was Tom Roach, who, who was kind of, kind of a behind-your-scenes sort of engineer. Uh, but he put together the um, nominations package because uh, as part of what we did was we, we nominated women whoops, um, for, for the different awards. And he put together uh, successful nomination packages again and again. So we were incredibly lucky um, to have women on our, or sorry, rather men on our, on our committee who were champions. And, and the other person in my tenure is, uh, with WEAC was... Um, when we did, um, were able to convince PEO Council to change the act, in my opinion, without the help of some of the uh, presidents who during that period were men, there is no way that that, 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 act, that act would have been changed. And they were in some, sometimes um, overtly uh, um, helpful to us, but in other ways subtly helpful, in that I recall one meeting we were at if the, if the president had put it to a vote at that meeting, it would have been defeated and we would have had an uphill battle, uh, but he didn't. He said we needed more information, we got a chance to regroup, we got a chance for council and executive to rethink, and when we came back, all the questions were about implementation as opposed to should we do it. And so um, in some of the initiatives that I've been involved with anyway, we've had uh, men who've been hugely helpful. Val? And I'll just echo what you're basically saying, that it's leadership that's really important. And in the uh, um, faculties of engineering, I know the ones in Ontario better than um, across Canada, but uh, there are clearly some deans and chairs that are taking that, male deans and, ch and uh, chairs who are taking that role, and it makes a big difference. But it, it's basically somebody who's going to um, show the way by, by, um, by the way that they act and, and, the, and their leadership. 
Okay, on that positive note, I'd like to uh, thank all the women uh, on this uh, panel. We've been... <laughs> and I have gifts for you. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I think we've been incredibly lucky because we have, all of these women are both trail bear, trailblazers and role models for all of us in, in uh, changing society and, and, and within the community of women in engineering. Thank you.